Oscar Olympia champion, Brandon Curry. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. Brandon, now, we spoke right after you won at the Mr. Olympia, and I had asked you if that had sunk in, that you are truly now Mr. Olympia, the 50th Mr. Olympia. You said that Jay Cutler said it takes about two to three weeks to sink in. Well, it's been about two to three months. Has it finally sunk in that you are, in fact, Mr. Olympia, the best bodybuilder in the world? I believe so, I believe so. Uh, it's uh, been a really, really busy uh, post Olympia experience. I've uh, been all over the world and uh, meeting a lot of fans, so it kind of solidifies uh, the title in my head, I guess. Uh, but for me, I'm still Brandon and I've still got work to do. And uh, I was looking into 2020 to see how I can improve and uh, keep the title. That's the, that's the name of the game for me. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this post-Olympia tour that you've been on. Now, you've done a really, you've had a hectic schedule, obviously. You have engaged in guest posing appearances. You've spoken at your kids' football camps. What's it been like representing the sport of bodybuilding as Mr. Olympia? And what lessons have you learned along the way that maybe you didn't know going into this process? Well, it's, it's definitely been an honor to represent our sport as, uh, as the champion. Uh, it just, it's a certain amount of intensity uh, being the champion wherever you go with the fans, uh, whether they, they love you or hate you. Uh, it's just a certain amount of energy uh, that it has when you carry the title. Um, I just didn't expect uh, the schedule to be so intense. I didn't expect, uh, you know, just all the, the energy coming at me from every every different angle. It's something that you can't really anticipate. Uh, but it's it's been a great experience of people, the amount of people that you actually impact, that you don't actually understand and know at the time is really important. The amount of people that you motivate just to see that you accomplished something that uh, may not have been easy for you to see the road that you've been on has been a really eye-opening thing. It's really humbled me in a lot of ways to, to realize the impact I've been able to have on people. Uh, but uh, it's it's just a, it's been an interesting experience and I'm still kind of processing the, the whole experience as, as we speak uh, because each and every opportunity is a time to learn and experience things and I just want to be open-minded and I want to just take everything in. So I haven't like over processed it in my head yet. You know what I'm saying? Well, before we go to 2020, which is obviously going to be your first title defense of the Mr. Olympia crowd, let's go back to 2019 Olympia. And look, when we spoke, it was roughly 45 minutes after you had just won the title. There was adrenaline flowing. Obviously, it was a totally different mindset that you were in. But now that you step back and you think back to that Olympia, the performance, the package. What in your mind was it that won you the title, that gave you the edge over William Bonac and Hadi Chupan? I just think ultimately, I was just the best man that day. It's like, that's how it goes. Um, I was able to bring a slightly different package from uh, the Arnold. And depending on what you like, as far as the bodybuilding criteria, it was a bigger package, it was a fuller package. But of course, I think my Arnold package was more conditioned. Some people like that package better. But some people like the package I brought. I think I was just able to just outshine. And my desire for the title, I think, was was uh, definitely strong when I look back at, at the intensity I had on stage. I just think it was just timing. And um, next year, I'm focused on next year, it, it, it's going to be about having this solid rest, this preparation, having this one show on my mind and it'll be the strongest show I come into. And, and coming from like 2018, doing the Olympia, then going right into the Arnold, and then going right into the Olympia in 2019, really I haven't had no rest. So having this opportunity to just kind of let my body rest, let my mind rest, and then just be able to focus only on the Olympia, I think it's gonna be a really, really dangerous but advantage to me coming into 2020. Well, you talked about the Arnold Classic, and that was part of the plan for 2019. First, how did you manage to peak twice in championship form, which is not the easiest thing for a bodybuilder to do? Second, what is the plan for 2020? Will you do the Arnold or are you going straight to the Olympia? Well, I will be going straight to the Olympia to answer that question. I will not be doing the Arnold. That was a really, really, I didn't understand the feat that that, that was until I actually was in the trenches. 
Uh, the arm prep for me was an easy prep. It was a breeze. My body responded to every way I wanted to. It was a no-brainer. But once you have to shut it down and then regroup without really having a major off-season or any off-season time where you get your calories high, that makes the next phase of dieting for the Olympia, your body's a little bit more resistant to that process. So it took a lot more work for me to bring up that package to the stage. And it, it wasn't, it, I, I say it wasn't like, it wasn't the ideal package that I wanted to bring, but for that, for that preparation, I was fighting to get my body in, uh, in, in that kind of shape and that condition to bring it down. My body wanted to actually probably grow at that point going into the Olympia prep because my weight was just wanting to climb, wanting to stay high. So I did more cardio, my calories were lower as I ever had them. And I'm not like one of those guys that diet on low carbohydrates, but this prep required me to do things that I didn't have to do because the body was just different from the Arnold prep. And uh, that's what I think a lot of people have, they can't really understand it until you experience or in the trenches. But doing those two shows, you think the distance will be to your advantage, but as the amateurs would say, it's like doing USAs and then trying to go do nationals. Uh, you know, you, sometimes you're just dealing with a whole different animal, a whole different body when you come in to try to do both shows. I guess that's why so many of you guys have been successful. And my wife let me know it's been 11 years uh, since uh, somebody has won the Arnold and won the Olympia the same year. And that's happened to be the year 2008 in which I went pro. And Dexter Jackson won that title. He was able to do that. So he was the last man to do that. And I think Ronnie Coleman was the first. Let's go back to 2017. And the reason I do that is because that was the year you won the All Australia, you won the New Zealand Pro, and you won the Frigno Legacy. In many minds, that was the, the watermark year for you where you landed into the quote-unquote elite of the bodybuilding class. At what point did you say to yourself, you know what, I am a contender for the Mr. Olympia title. Was it that year? Was there something about that tour? What was that aha moment for you? The aha moment is when I was on the Olympia stage in that year, 2017, and they called me out in the first call out. I was like, aha, <laughs> the work has paid off, has paid off. And uh, so it's like a sacrifice and it's like an eye-opening moment. I'm up here being compared with the top guys. I want to see these pictures. I want to see how close these things are. And it didn't turn out for me that I didn't, I wasn't in the top five, but it came out to the finals uh, for whatever reason. But I got a chance to see myself against the top guys and really analyze that. And then not being in the top five, but we thought we were going to be really put a fire in front of my ass, really pissed me off in a good way. So I wanted to come back in the next season and prove to myself that y'all yeah, did something wrong. So, uh, you know, that, that was just, that was the eye opening moment for me. We're here in Dubai. Obviously, you've been training at Kuwait, in Kuwait at the Oxygen Gym for the last, I want to say, what, three years now? Yeah, three seasons. Finally, that process was validated in you winning the Olympia. Are you back in Kuwait right now? If not, when do you plan on going back to Oxygen to start your prep for the 2020 Olympia? I think I was in Kuwait about a month ago, uh, just to visit. Uh, Batter had some party for me and catch up with the guys. And it was really a chance for me to kind of decompress from all the travel because it's kind of like a second home. So I got to actually get some sleep and uh, I trained a little bit whenever my coach felt like it, but it wasn't really serious. But I just kind of kind of regrouped before I got back on the road. And uh, so it was a really good opportunity to kind of kind of be at a home base. But I will not go back and so uh, after the Arnold Classic. The Arnold Classic, I'm gonna be there at the show. I'm gonna see what's going on. That show's gonna motivate me, of course, to see what's going on at that show. We go back into Kuwait, get the off season started, and really, really push for two months until I come, have to come back for uh, the uh, Pittsburgh I'll Expo. I was about to ask you you are in fact going to be there. Yes, so that'll give me two months of off season, and then I'll spend some time in the U.S. before deciding when to come back to back to Kuwait to cut down for my prep. Of course, it's going to be balanced because I have a baby coming. Uh, in uh, congratulations. We think it's maybe like around July early July or, 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 or late uh, June. How about that? Right. So, you know, I want to be there, of course, for the delivery and then head back to do some work. So, you know, on that note, because it's well documented that you've been in Kuwait for the last three years, when you think long term, obviously this being your first title defense, do you say to yourself, you know what, I accomplished my mission, 
I'm going to stay home now and train from home, prep from home, or is Kuwait still going to be in your long-term future as you try to chase multiple titles, multiple Olympia titles? Well, the, the moral of the story is if it's not broke, don't fix it. So being, being where I am and, and being what I've accomplished, I will ha I have to spend less time in Kuwait than I did initially, but I will still go there to put my ultimate focus into being a champion because yeah, like I said, my environment will be very, very hectic when I'm at home. I'll be going on having five kids in the house with yeah. their own schedules. So I'm, I'm going to need that time to get away to really focus on just being the best bodybuilder I can be. So, And being in my coach is so hands-on and he's so uh, involved in looking at me and making the adjustments on the fly. It's to my advantage to always be in that, his, under his eyes when I'm uh, in preparation. Well, well, here in the Middle East, you've been in the Middle East now for three years. Well, what kind of a relationship have you developed here with the local fan base in Kuwait here in the United Arab Emirates? Well, it's been all, it's been all love and it's been all, all respect. Of course, I've got to visit you know, this area and all over the Middle East, uh, you know, multiple times. I've been to Iraq. I've been to, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia. Of course, I've been here multiple times. So I've got to experience a lot of different you know, fans and a different type of bodybuilders around the region. and. Uh, I like to think I'm an encouragement for uh, those guys that are in this region that this, you can come here, you can be in this, this region and accomplish great things. They have all the tools necessary to be great. So it's, it's been nothing but love and a lot of, a lot of fanfare. And when it really come, took away, it's really like a family for me and a, a brotherhood because you know, we all encourage each other, we all push each other. And uh, you know, they just want to see that get, to that respect, you know, that, they, that that gym holds and that area holds for what can be produced out of there. And I wouldn't be able to do it without it. So I owe those guys a lot just to be able to have that environment for me to go to and to, to welcome me in and to just basically allow me to be the best I can be. It's, it's just utmost respect. And like I said, there's a lot of great physiques in this, in this, uh, in this region. And, it, and uh, it really motivates me to even work harder because when I see these guys and I see these great talents, coming up in the gym and they're training hard and busting their butts, you know, I gotta step my game up, you know. When I see when I see a Roly, when I see a Ramey, when I see when I see these guys in the gym, uh, you know, it just really is one of those things that kinda let me know, okay, yeah, I'm in a battle. These guys, I respect these guys. I gotta bring my A game, you know, I can't be slacking. So this 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 environment out here and the gyms and the and the growth of the fitness community, uh, it's incredible. And uh, if, if I, my Westerners and uh, some of my European friends, if you don't get to experience that, you will never understand how much they respect and love the sport out here. Let's talk a little bit more about this past Olympia. Now, there is a concept, or a debate rather, as far as direction of the sport versus what's on the stage. Now, the last two Mr. Olympia between you and Sean Rodin, I guess you could classify more that, that streamlined look, whereas with Phil Heath, you want to say it was in the class of the mass monsters. Do you believe in direction, or do you believe that the judges are strictly going to judge what's up on the stage? I don't believe in direction. Uh, we've proven that wrong over and over again. When Dexter won in 2008, we thought it was a direction. Jacob had come back and he took the title, so they just, just totally just, you know, messed that whole idea up. What I do understand is Phil Hugh kind of started in a genre where it stands. He kept pushing the limit, he kept getting bigger, the freakier, and of course, some people would consider him a mass monster. Honestly, if you look at the scale weight, he wouldn't be considered a mass monster in my book. But he's just got such freaky, a freaky effect on stage, and such 3D, it gives the illusion to people that he's just so big. So, uh, I mean, they're gonna go with what they see, and, uh, and really the judges, they judge you uh, kind of on your own personal improvements. And that's been my advantage. I've been able to improve from show to show. And just give me a little bit more time and I'll be able to improve for the next show. And I think they're gonna base this next Olympia on who is bringing the best package to the stage, but who has been able to exceed themselves and bring even a better package to the stage. And, that, and, that's, what, and that's, that's what kind of convinces the judges the most, because that kind of shows that you put the work in and you're doing the work bodybuilding and, and you're still hungry for the title, you know? Well, speaking of Phil Heath, and we're going to have him on this stage tomorrow at the Q&A stage. We had Phil Heath, Dave Palumbo had Phil Heath on RX Muscle about a week ago to promote uh, his appearance here at the Dubai Muscle Show. And look, there has been a lot of talk post-Olympia, a lot of criticism post-Olympia. Well, Phil Heath came out 
and if I paraphrase it, he said something to the effect of that had he been in the lineup, he probably would have won. He expressed disappointment saying that there were, he wasn't, the fact that he wasn't in the lineup, there wasn't that rabbit to chase, and he felt as if there were a lot of missed opportunities in his own words. When he says that had he been in the lineup, he probably would have won, how do you respond to that? Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. It don't exist in my, in my vocabulary if, what if, you know? What if is for when you're a little kid and you got imagination, you got a dream, you got things to accomplish. When you accomplish, man, like Phil, he, he should be using the term what if because it's, it, you know, you're well accomplished. It shouldn't be a what if. It's just that if you're gonna do something, get it done, go get the check. But we know this is about staying relevant. And when you don't compete, you gotta use other means to stay relevant. And I respect the hustle, because Kai Green has taught us how important that is as well. So we're gonna let him stay relevant and say, you know, what it shoulda, coulda, because some fans enjoy that. And they enjoy that shoulda, woulda, coulda. We got a whole internet uh, comparison, uh, people that are famous for comparing pictures on the internet with that shoulda, woulda, coulda concept. So it's a part of the industry and uh, it's a way to draw attention back to yourself. So, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda, let's bring it. Well, in your opinion, in Brandon Curry's words, if Phil Heath was in the 2019 Olympia lineup, would Brandon Curry still be Mr. Olympia today? Of course I would, because if he, if he, it's a reason why he wasn't in that lineup. If he thought he could win, as competitive as he was, he would definitely win on that stage. But of course, any champion that doesn't think they can win, they're not gonna get on stage. But a true champion that thinks they're gonna win, it will be on stage. Why would they not? There was also much made of Dorian Yates' comments, and it was made on uh, with Patrick Bet David. You actually went on later on to respond with Patrick Bet David. He expressed disappointment in the overall lineup, and then obviously he had his critiques of you as Mr. Olympia. Dorian aside, there seems to be that sentiment amongst the older competitors, those who've been there in the 90s, and then those who are fans of the 90s, of the quality first today. To that, you respond with what? Considering your, you as Mr. Olympia and the lineup that was at the 2019 Olympia. I think uh, any, any era of bodybuilding where there's change, there's gonna be people complaining. And we just live in an era where there's social media and everybody can complain, complain publicly and get uh, attention and get an audience on their complaints. Uh, I think when Dorian came in after Lee Haney, there probably was a lot of complaints that if Lee Haney could still compete, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be a champion. But we didn't hear that sentiments because, you know, the magazines would have had to follow that, that narrative or, you know, you would have had to read a, read a lot of people's disappointment letters to maybe Lee Haney wishing he would be back in Olympia again to, you know, to beat Dorian Yates. So we just live in an era where we hear the complaining, we hear the comparison, we, we hear the nostalgia from those who uh, reflect on those times which they, you know, may deem better than other times. But at the end of the day, it's just a fun game of what ifs and imaginations, you know, that we can, we can create a narrative out of, we can create content out of, and we can get the fans to follow and uh, have a debate. Brandon, remove yourself from this equation. There seems to be the never-ending debate between who trained harder, who suffered more, between the 90s and today. Uh, we had an episode where we had Fuad Abiyad and Luke Sandow, where Fuad Abiyad, as an example, said, look, wh what does it mean to suffer? Does it mean low carbs, four hours of cardio? Well, I I've been there. What do you say to those that say that today's competitors don't know how to suffer or, quote, don't train hard? I'll be realistic. I, I listen to that narrative coming up as a bodybuilder to try to get better. And I try to put myself in a position of where, okay, where, where can I suffer, where can I work hard, or where can I do this and where can I do that? It became a point to where I put myself in a position where I was working against myself with this concept of being harder and thinking this suffering and, 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 and going through these preps, you know, with these extreme measures was gonna make me a better bodybuilder. At the end of the day, it never made me a bodybuilder, it made me worse. And it took somebody to say, look, you gotta work with your body there's a certain amount of sacrifice and a certain amount of discomfort you gotta experience, but each body is different, and being stressed and overstressed as a physique is not gonna make you a better bodybuilder at the end of the day, so it's gotta be a middle ground. It's a little give and take. Well, there's certain genres of bodybuilders, there's certain uh, branding of certain picture of bodybuilder personalities, 
from back in the day that, you know, we say we're more hardcore, more blue collar. But when we really look at it, we only have a few examples of what that really means uh, when it comes to the, the documentation of it. You know, we say blood and guts. We watch that and say, we think Dorian chained like that every single day when he was in the gym. Uh, we see Ronnie's videos that he came out with. We said, oh, Ronnie trained like that every single day. He, he did lift 80, 800 pounds every week. You know what I'm saying? We look at that and we, and we want to make that, you know, the consistent part of, uh, or the norm in bodybuilding. But really, these, these are the cameras on, this is entertainment. And we know bodybuilding is about, you know, your peaks and valleys. Sometimes you can really turn it on and that's good for you. Sometimes you need to back it off and that's better for you. But it's really about going with what is best for your body to get the best out of your physique. And I had to learn that. I had to learn that the unnecessary, uh, you know, just dying myself in the ground was not going to get me better. I was going to be working really, really hard, but I was going to look soft. I was going to look small on stage at the end of the day. So I had to get a coach behind me and let me know, oh, no, no, you can't do this to your body. Your body is not going to respond the way we want it, to, want it to look if we stress it out too much. So you can go with that approach, oh, we don't work harder, they don't suffer more, or there's cell phones in the gym, you know, we can make all these excuses. But I've, I've studied bodybuilding and I've seen a lot of photos of a lot of bodybuilders that come on sometimes, it didn't come on a lot of times back in the day. But we don't really have that to highlight modernly. We only see like the best of the best stuff on the internet from that era. We don't see <laughs> But, you know, oh, look, you know, we don't see the Phil Heath stomach photos from that era where people are just trying to get attention on the internet. We don't see that kind of stuff. And the magazines made it a point to edit the magazine to be marketed in a way to where it makes sales. And back then, it wasn't about the controversy. It was about getting the best photos possible, making the bodybuilders look like they're superhuman and they're bigger than life. And that's how they sold the magazines. So it wasn't about the picking out the details. It wasn't about the scrutiny and the critiques that we see today in bodybuilding. It was about these guys you rarely get to see and you only see in the magazines being produced as these big personalities to get you to follow it, get you to pick up the magazine, get you to follow their workout routine and get you to buy their products. The game is different today. Let's talk about 2020 and you specifically. You made it clear that you will next be competing at the 2020 Olympia. When you review your look on stage at the 2019 Olympia, at the 2019 Arnold Classic, specifically, what improvements do you say to yourself, I need to make in order to have a successful first time in defense? And in, in general, is there a look that you say to yourself, this is what I'm going to aspire based on what I look like in 2019? Yeah, I need to bring uh, the fat, the mass, and the fullness of the Olympia with the combination of the crispness of the uh, Arnold Classic in 2019. Basically, I need to come to, a, to the stage with a less stressed out physique from, you know, the, 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 uh, the pressures of the, of the season, which is easy to do when I'm only focusing on the Olympia. But I also need to bring in something new for the judges to critique and say, okay, Brandon has brought this in, he's improved this way. I think I little, need a little bit more lap width, I need a little bit more hamstring detail, thickness around the glutes and stuff like that. There's areas that we're really gonna focus on. I need to work on sometimes my presentation. Uh, the presentation for the Olympia could have been, a, could have been better as well. Uh, I need to focus on bringing out more details in my midsection because some of the competitors that are, that, are, that are compared to me have favors in that position that draw that people draw attention to. Who do you think uh, they compare you with mostly? Well, you know, when it comes to, when you bring a physique like, uh, let's say, let's say Hadi Chupon on the stage, and he stands in there front relaxed and he's got those really edge style detail app, you know, people haven't seen that before. That's impressive. They like, they never seen Hadi like that comparison. It stands out. It makes him really stand out in that position. I mean, he may not win every pose, but those poses really stand out. And it really, you know, I gotta be able to compare or really show them that, you know, I can, you know, that's 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 something that you could be impressed with, but and I got something too. So a certain thing, there's certain poses that I want to look dominant in that maybe I didn't dominate in 2019. So I gotta work on those ways to actually dominate in those in those poses and not just be maybe the most round, the most the most uh, aesthetic physique, but I want to be competitive on every level. So the arguments seem stupid to, to most people. Let's talk about your legs because that was a critique from a lot of the bodybuilding fans following the Olympia. What were your, was your assessment of your legs and how do you now improve on that in 2020? Uh, it was, it was a, a different look from the Arnold. Arnold, my legs had more separation in the, in, the, in the depth, so it creates more depth in the legs. 
at the Olympia, my legs were bigger, but they would lack the separation that they had at the Arnold, given given the effect, that, not really enhancing the effect. So when you have somebody on stage like Hottie Chupon with a deep, deep separation, the quads are uh, probably his dominant body part on stage, and then you make the direct comparison when you look at from muscle to muscle group. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that I'm not, I'm fully recovered going into the Olympia, so my legs, you know, they don't, I don't hold water in those areas. I need to focus on exercises that's gonna bring out more detail, more separation. I just need to go back in the trenches and make sure I'm not overdoing things going into the prep. Because I got pictures from farther out where my legs look really, really good. Uh, but going into the Olympia, you know, you got that push, 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 push. And sometimes that over push can kind of put your body a little bit over the edge to where you hit a peak and then you're going in reverse. So I need to make sure I'm not overdoing the cardio. My legs are not too beat up going into the next show. And I'm doing what I need to do in the off season to bring uh, that more density, more impact, more more change. So I have less uh, that likelihood of going into a show with that body part being stressed out, beat up is, is less likely. You brought up Hadi Chuban twice now. This was his first appearance in the United States. Now some fans saw him in person at the Vancouver Pro, but before that, aside of the appearance with Flex Lewis in South Korea three years ago, he seemed to really be a mystery man. You, I believe this is your second time competing against him, right? Your assessment of Hadi Chupan, especially what he brought to this past Olympia. Okay, I, I speak about Hadi because I know there's a lot of Iranian fans, Persian fans here, and I know I know a lot of this, this, this uh, fans have come up and spoken to me and let me know that they appreciate me and the sport. And I just want respect because Hadi's a great, great champion. Uh, he, he, I had experience with him in 2017. He came in, and I had to learn his game because. I underestimated how he at that show. Of course, I qualified at the, the show before. Um, I didn't really want to do the show because I would already qualified. And it was a long season. It was my fifth show of the year. So I couldn't really back out because I signed the contract. So I just did the show to do the show, knowing that they were going to give it to Cedric because he needed to qualify. And uh, I didn't. So, but I just, I was giving my attendance thing. But Heidi came in and he took notice. And I was, you know, recommended to help him on stage because, you know, he has a hearing disability. So, and I, he didn't understand. I, I don't know how much English he understands. So, I was helping Heidi, you know, uh, come here, be here. But then I noticed he was a master on the stage. He's a master on pose. He's really aggressive on stage. He's gonna, he's gonna get the edge on you. He's trying to get the angle on you. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So I, I was like, oh man, I gotta respect this guy's game. A lot of guys didn't really recognize that. His game on stage is superior. He has a lot of experience on stage. He's a very, very polished bodybuilder. And uh, so seeing him and then seeing him up against Nathan and how he was able to embarrass Nathan with that stage game that, that some guys are just not aware of. Uh, and, and then you see the photos and you know he looks 10 times bigger than he's supposed to be. Elaborate a little bit more on the stage game because that was, that was a talking point in the 2019 Olympia. Well, it's, the stage game is, there's a lot going on on stage. You guys are just looking at us. But there's a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of body. We're always trying to get the advantage. And if you're not aware of the positioning of your competitor on stage, you may get left in the dust on some shots. And there's a strategy that some bodybuilders have that where they're gonna get the advantage. They're gonna, they're gonna make, take that time to pose. They may hit the pose. There's a certain type of shuffle step that guys use. There's all kinds of things that guys use to kind of get the advantage where they wanna be presented better than somebody else. So. As a, as a technique, we call it cheating the line. There's a line here. And uh, let's say, if, if I'm two feet above front of the line, and the guy's on the line, I'm gonna be bigger than him in pictures, and I'm gonna be bigger than him to the judges that, and the fans that can't see. I may not be bigger than him. We all see it. Guys, you know, they know how to out-angle you in photos and all that kind of stuff. It's the same kind of effect. So when you have an argument, maybe maybe the judges understand it. Okay, they can see it. and. Uh, and they can compare, that's how they know what's going on, they can judge it fairly. But when you see a picture, and the fans see it, they go, go oh, ooh, he won this shot, oh, he's so big doing this shot, you know? And they're gonna, it's gonna be an argument based on the picture, based on the, the two depth perception that you can't really see unless you, you know, you can't see the difference unless you're in 3D and you're in real life. So uh, when we see these things and they present these arguments, uh, a lot of times, you know, even though you may not, you may not have won something, you can you can get gain that fan respect, or you can gain that argument based on oh, it's based on pictures. 
So uh, I just had to do what I needed to do and, and to come up with strategies to either make it obvious if I was too late or, or move up when I can move up. The only way to make it obvious is if you let them overlap you, which some guys don't know that. So you move closer to him. If he's in front of you, his arms are in front of you, and your arm is behind him, you know he's in front of you, you know? So that's the only way if the guy gets ahead of you, though, but I'm not gonna give too much of secrets away, I guess. This is how many people see this, we don't know. But yeah, so it's a whole lot of game and strategy, but I got backstage with William, and I had to let him know. I was like, look, I showed him some pictures. He was like, oh. He said, this is what happened. He said, oh, oh. Yeah, so now we're good. Because yeah, we're, good. Good. Cause we're boys, you know, yeah, right. we're boys. I didn't want to be pissed off. So yeah, it's a, it's a whole game that you play on stage, and you know, the judges. They, they let it go sometimes and you know you just gotta get the advantage that they give you it's a it's a it's just com competitive nature now i have to ask i know this was kind of kept under covers for a long time but that stage game seemed to have tensions backstage as well if you could elaborate a little bit on what happened there was a video leak obviously honey chupan had to be calmed down uh something happened backstage the details are murky what can you tell us about what happened I really don't know what happened. I just know uh, I heard commotion. William looks like he was talking. Hottie was upset. I walk over. Hottie starts talking to me. I don't know what Hottie said. And then they uh, they just started instructing me to to leave. So I, I I leave. You know they escort me out and I just leave. And apparently you know some altercation. Some somebody understood some things that was said and they, they may have took my defense for me. And you know, but I was gone by then, so I don't even know. So it was a little drama, it gets a little heated, but I will say it was all love. Me and Hadi, we talked to his translator and everything was good. So it wasn't really any bad blood about finals, but you know, sometimes, you know, everybody wants to win, it can be intense. And uh, you know, you know, you're champions, you just gotta respect that, 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 uh, that, that desire to win. So, you know, that's one of those things with Dorian said, what Dorian said about me, I'm like, that's what made him a champion. You know, he, he's, you know, he's gonna think he's the best, he's gonna, you know, he has that mentality you know, I'm the best, I, I did it this way, my way, you know, it's, that's what made him a champion. So I'm not gonna be offended by that, it's just boring. Let's talk about this next Olympia now. This past Olympia, there were notable absences, there was no Phil Heath, there was no Big Bobby, obviously there was no Sean Roden. You look ahead to 2020, we still don't know Sean Ro uh, rather uh, Phil Heath's gonna be there. It's projected that Flex Lewis is gonna be there, Big Rami's trying to get qualification. When you consider that the 2020 Olympia class will be, and I don't want to say stronger because that may be offensive to those that were on the stage, but it is going to include more names, more notable names. How do you now as champion prepare for that from a mental standpoint? And then how does that translate into your prep and what you need to bring considering that competition? At the end of the day, uh, my whole focus is getting better. It's not on beating a certain guy. Uh, I just got to get better regardless because I'm a champ and uh, I got people on my heels. Um, as far as it being competitive, I, I wanted to be more competitive. I'm like, bring it on because it gives me an opportunity to just continue to shine, to uh, cancel out some arguments. So, you know, the more guys that's on stage, the more comparisons I get, the better for me. It's actually motivating. As soon as Phil Heath commits to saying, I'm gonna do the Olympia, that's gonna be motivating for me. It's, it's gonna be like, oh yeah, he's gonna do the Olympia. He finally said it, you know? I'm waiting on him to say it. You know, Flex Lewis being in there, okay, great. I wanna see what, what I look like compared to Flex Lewis. You know, I'm giving people something to talk about. Well, but does that excite you to see what, again, considering Flex Lewis jumping up from the 212, when you look at his package that he brings and what he projects to bring to the open class, what is a competitor? Does that excite you or are you saying, yes, I, I got to do my homework knowing that he's going to bring something different to the stage this time? Yeah, well, the homework is the same for me. It did not matter what competitor I got to match up against, but I'm just, I'm, I look at the holes in his game and I wonder if he's going to be able to fix it uh, to, uh, to, to bring a dangerous package to the stage. Uh, you know, is it, he's, he's taking a risk, you know, and is he, is he going to be able to uh, do enough to uh, to make this a worthwhile uh, decision for jumping up a class. Because you know the worst thing you can do is make a decision and disappoint, uh, disappoint the fans. And I know he doesn't want to do that. So it's a lot of pressure on him. And how he's dealing with that pressure to, to be in an open class, I'm just curious to how he's going to deal with it. And is he going to be able to bring the same kind of conditioning that he brought when he was in 212? 
you know, what game is he going to play? I'm just curious as a bodybuilder, you know, how do you make that transition? And, uh, you know, what's going on in your head during that process? Because I know, you know, bodybuilding is a lot of mental, mental and, uh, you know, just having something, I mean, for me, just imagining going from one class and just jumping up into another one, as I did as an amateur, it just has a different, certain impact on you, especially if you was a champion in the other division. So I was handling that. That's what I'm curious about. You now approaching this next Olympia as the champion. Obviously, it hasn't happened yet. You haven't stepped on stage. If you can project forward to the 2020 Olympia, what do you envision it's going to be like when they say, Pump the United States, Brandon Curry, and you step on that Olympia stage for the first time as a champion? <laughs> I, I just, I, honestly, I want to step on the stage and I want to, I want to, the, the whole mentality, I just want to, I want to just, I want to just be like, damn, wow, like, I just wanted to say, damn, like, oh my goodness, like, okay, okay, uh, we're going to see how, who's going to get second, that's what I wanted to say, uh, because, you know, I, I just want to solidify, you know, the, my legacy at this point uh, as a champion, and like I said, that's why, I, you know, as a champion, I want to see, I want to be able to see what, what my body is going to look like in comparison to the guys that may have been missing if they choose to come back or not. Uh, I know that's the narrative everybody's feeding and it's going to last for so long, but until we step on that stage. So I want to be able to just cancel all those questions and, and have uh, everybody create a new argument for the next season. So. Last question, well, a couple of more questions. One, Oxygen Gym, people have wondered what goes on there. What is it that they do over there? There is the quote, secret of oxygen, Jimmy. You've been there for three years now. You are now Mr. Olympia. If you had to put it in words, what is the secret of oxygen, Jimmy? I don't know no secrets because I don't know what Roley does. And uh, I don't know what any of the other guys have done. I just know what my coach has me do. And we have different coaches. And uh, I say the, the secret is, you know, you guys sometimes have trainers and people that are coaching you and you're sending pictures. and. You know, you're doing updates, but when somebody is there with you in the flesh, they'll do cardio with you, they'll be training with you, they see you on a, on a daily basis, multiple times a day. That gives a certain level of intimacy and a, and a, a way of learning the physique that you wouldn't get on the internet or internet trainer or if you see a coach every once in a while or whatever it may be. So honestly, I think the intensity of and the magnitude, magnitude of that uh, microscope or that looking glass on your physique is what can make a body go to better. Now, the biggest the biggest thing with a coach is trust. And I can say for sure, Abdullah, I trust him and his decisions on my physique, because if I didn't, maybe I'd make some mistakes that other bodybuilders make and seek a second opinion. And I think sometimes when guys are not successful, it's because maybe they're taking too much advice with too many directions. And uh, you know, when you have one guy guiding you and then another guy not guiding you and giving you advice, it throws off the guy that's supposed to be guiding you. So I think the trust relationship I have with my coach and in the environment I'm having to focus totally on bodybuilding is the secret to the success. My success at Oxygen Gym. You've been with SciTech for quite a lot of years now. It's been a spot. It's kind of rare now in the bodybuilding world where you have an athlete stay with a supplement company for as long as you and SciTech have been together. If you want to give SciTech a shout out, given that now you are representative as a champion as Mr. Olympia. Uh, definitely, man. I wouldn't be able to, you know, travel the world as I have and develop all the fans from around the world without a global company like SciTech Nutrition. Uh, it's one of those brands that, you know, it's just not about the hype. It's actually about the quality of the products. You know, it's one of the only companies that batch, batch tests. This company is responsible for their own manufacturing, which is kind of rare. So they, they, you know, they can depend upon and produce the quality at a lower cost to the customers. So uh, it's, it's one of the advantages of being with a company that you can stand behind because you respect and uh, that so, so wide spread with a reach that you can create fans and a following from all over the world. And uh, you know, I'm just really, really blessed to have an opportunity to be represented by a company of this caliber and this, and this quality and in this magnitude. Brandon Curry, your reigning Mr. Olympia champion. Brandon, first of all, congratulations on you and your wife expecting a kid, the fifth kid, correct? Yes, sir, yes, sir. That's great news. Obviously, you're gonna be 
expecting about two, three months before your first Olympian title defense. Pleasure as always. Do we have any questions from the crowd? All right, if, if we can get the gentleman over here on microphone. Uh, since Phil, Sean, and Big Ravi took a break, you had an edge over them? That's my question to you. Yeah, I think being Mr. Olympia obviously gives me the edge already. I think uh, those guys not being able to, uh, the longer you stay off stage, the, the less time you have to assess your body and the changes that it's made. So the next preparation is like a new frontier, a different experience. Uh, so uh, yes, I think I do have the advantage being uh, able to also improve my physique consistently from uh, season to season also gives me advantage because I, I think I'm in a prime of my career right now and my body is at a point to where it's really cooperating in my favor. And uh, I know it's not been announced yet, but coming back to 2020, uh, do you think uh, them competing back or coming back for the next year with the three big names like Philippe, Big Ravi, and Sean Roden, would that intimidate you in any way or do you have any second thoughts? I know you maybe not, but no, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a very exciting thing for me as well as it, it is an exciting thing for bodybuilding. It's a very exciting thing for me because it, it gives me an opportunity to prove myself and also step up my game. You know, it's, bodybuilding is about competition. It's always been about competition. And when you're trying to be the best of the best, you want the competition. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> what, what, is, what is it without competition? So it's something that I'm really looking forward to. I mean, I really wanted to compete against Sean Roden um, this year. I mean, that's really what hyped me up for the season, you know, for 2019 season. But, and not having the opportunity was kind of a disappointment. So I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. I, I mean, I've been t trying to get Phil Heath to do the, do the Olympia since the Arnold in 2019 when I won. So it's no question that I want these guys on stage because, like I said, I got, I got a lot to prove. And, you know, it's not just about winning one title for me. Uh, thanks a lot. Last question. Uh, what's your uh, cheat meal? What's your favorite cheat meal? Uh, cheat meal is, uh, uh, what, what do you guys want to eat? Uh, that's what a cheat meal is for me, because I'm not a real picky person, and I don't have favorites. So it's like, I ask my family or whoever I'm around, what y'all want to eat, and I can enjoy anything. Uh, 